in the Senate, yeah. Yeah. but it was said that initially that it was just it was that's the way it was. <laughs> Wasn't any irritation. Oh, one. We need one more reader. I can read. Well, go for it. <laughs> Apparently, I can talk now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, you got the text? Five. There we go, we're at 159. B. That's correct, D. B. B. Stefana's number, D, as we in... D or B? As in dollars. B. Yes. B, B, B. B, 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 B. 159 B, like in boy. What boy is in there? <laughs> we shall not. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Um, I'd rather go to 159B as in Butterfields. Butterfield. Yeah, that's what I meant. And Butterflies. Oh. Then, then what if we now drop these matters as evidence and again consider whether if one is, the other things than one are as we have said? and there is no alternative. Certainly. Let us begin then at the beginning. If one is, and ask, if one is, what must happen to the things which are other than one? By all means. Must not the one be separate from the others, and the others from the one? Why is that? Why? Good. Why is that? Because there is nothing else besides these, which is other than one and other than the others. Right, it has to be other than the others. Mm -hmm. And if it's other than the others, <laughs> no it one. sure as heck has to be so different. Go ahead. For when we have said one and the others, we have included all things. Yes, all things. Then there is nothing other than these in which both the one and the others may be. No. Then the one and the others can never be in the same. Apparently not. But never in the same. Watch the word in throughout. Uh, then they are separate? Yes. Notice how he reasoned just to make sure it was separate. Go ahead. Can we go back? Next. And surely we say that what is truly one has no parts. How can it have parts? Then the one cannot be in the others as a whole, nor can parts of it if it is separate from the others and, and has no parts. Of course not. That's an odd sentence. <laughs> then the one cannot be in the others as a whole, nor can parts of it, if it is, oh, nor can parts of it, I see, if it is separate from the others and has no parts. Of course not. Then the others cannot partake of the one in any way. Right, in any way, no participation. They can neither partake of any part of it, nor of the whole. No, apparently not. The others are then not one in any sense, nor have the others are then not one in any sense, nor have they in themselves any unity. No. But neither are the others many. For if they were many, each of them would be one part of the whole. But actually, the things that are other than one are not many, nor a whole, nor parts, since they do not participate in the one in any way. Right. Neither are the others two or three, nor are two or three in them, if they are entirely deprived of unity. True. Nor are the others either themselves like and unlike the one nor are likeness and unlikeness in them. For they were 
For if they were like and unlike, or had likeness and unlikeness in them, the things which are other than the one would have in them two elements opposite to one another. That is clear. But it is impossible for that to partake of two things which does not even partake of one. Impossible. <laughs> now that was clever, wasn't yep. it? Yep. Was Do it again. Well, it's a good yeah, one. I like it. Um, nor are the other. Let me borrow this one. Sure. Okay. Nor are the others either themselves like and unlike the one, nor are likeness and unlikeness in them. For if they were like and unlike, or had likeness and unlikeness in them, the things which are other than the one would have in them two elements opposite to one another. That is clear. But it is impossible for that to partake of two things which does not even partake of one. Impossible. The others are then not like nor unlike nor both. For if they were like or unlike, they would partake of one of the two elements, and if they were both of the two opposites, and that was shown to be impossible. True. They are then neither the same, nor other, nor in motion, nor at rest, nor becoming, nor being destroyed, nor greater, nor less, nor equal, and they experience no similar affections. For if the others are subject to such affections, they will participate in one and two and three and odd and even, in which we saw that they cannot participate, if they are in every way utterly deprived of unity. Right, because unity follows from one and oneness, right? That's the fifth hypothesis. Therefore, if and one exists the one is all things no no then that's the conclusion for the oh sorry for two to five okay right so therefore we use the word last week to for that what would it be transcendental transcendent right transcendent no and no way does it touch but it's more than transcendent it's a pure transcendent. Yeah, there's no participation. Because transcendent often means not 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 tangent to it. It doesn't touch in any way. But this is the property. None of the properties of one can be attributed to the fifth hypothesis. Therefore, in no way is the one or any of the ideas that can be derived from it possible to be attributed to, uh, to the others. Wow. Is there such a thing as a one, given all that? I don't if know what you Oh, just... Don't back away and run away well, from Well, just... If there, is there a one, given that? If there... Well, I mean, where is the one, then? We don't know where the one is, but if it starts with the one see. is, okay. it doesn't have to be anywhere. Okay. okay. But if it is so other than the others, what follows? Then there's no participation. They're and separate. Separate, no parts, no whole, no unity, not but many. But these ideas presuppose one. some property of the one or one, or oneness. So, if you have the idea of one... You couldn't even call others other. Well, that would finally come down to, to even the idea of it being plural, as he says you can say. Many. Right. So, in no way can it be... A, in no way can the others use any term that's derivative of the one. Wow. Oneness, unity, whole. Word parts presupposes each part being a part, one part. And therefore, you can't pull it all together as a unity because then that's assuming there's the property of oneness present in the others, so that's out. 
There's some people who think this way. Pardon? I said there's some position that thinks this way. There's some position that holds this position. Well, you gave the name to it. Well, I, I did. didn't. Transcendental, Transcendental meditation. Is wonderful. Try to get there. <laughs> how do they ex how do they explain themselves in this mix? Each of them individually. You are seeing the difficulties in having a pure transcendental oh, view if that's see key. you if you use the word God and say God transcends all creation then you don't get the same point if you say excuse me what do you mean by the word God do you mean the God the idea of God being the one ah then we can make all of these conclusions yeah. that's why the word God is a, is a problem yeah, so. Because if you say God is one, or if one of the highest ways you can talk about God is the one, then can you then use it in the way in which traditionally it is used to justify certain systems, including transcendentalism? That's where it goes. Oh. I, see. I believe there's a niner. Yeah. Page 329. Stephanus? Just page. I know 165, oh, right? 165E. Right. You got the Stephanus numbers, 165E. takes the the negatives right he switches right? So if others exist but the one does not This is, if one is, if the one can be said to be, what are the consequences on the other? When he talks about it negatively, he's like, the others exist. Let's see what happens if we say the one does not. Mm -hmm. Okay. All set? Julie, do you have a text? No, not tonight. Someone got an extra te text yeah, to make Thomas her work? Taylor. <laughs> Otherwise, she might just make notes, and that's boring as hell. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Page 329. And it gives the appearance of following in the sun. Shall we get our team ready? All right. Okay. That's not there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's at the very beginning. Let us then go back once more to the beginning and tell the consequences if the others exist and the one does not. Let us do so. Well, the others will not be one. Of course not. Now, will they be many? For if they were many, oh, excuse me, nor will they be many. For if they were many, one would be contained in them. And if none of them is one, they are all nothing, so that they cannot be many. True. If one is not contained in the others, the others are neither many nor one. No. <laughs> and they do not even appear to be one or many. Remember, appear takes both sides, not even appearance, right? Well. So, if not... It's not even an illusion. Nor even the appearance of one. Yeah. I like his question. Why is that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Because, Why is that? yeah. 
Well, because the others have no communion in any way whatsoever with anything which is non-existent, and nothing that is non-existent pertains to any of the others. Now, let me read that again. Now, you want to read that again, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Because the others have no communion in any way whatsoever with anything which is non-existent, and nothing that is non-existent pertains to any of the others. They can't have any communion with anything that's non-existent, agree? Right, and nothing that is non-existent pertains to any of the others. Oh, I see. For things that are non-existent have no parts. True. Nor is there any opinion or appearance of the non-existent in connection with the others. Nor is, oh, I see, so the non-existent no. is kind of the one. That's right. Okay, got it. Nor is the non-existent conceived of in any way whatsoever as related to the others. Right. Nor is there any opinion or appearance of the non-existent in connection, right, with the others. Nor is the non-existent conceived or can you have an opinion of it in any way whatsoever as related to the others if it doesn't exist in any of these forms or manners. So he doesn't use one here. He uses non-existent yeah. as a... Huh? Well, because... It doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> Interesting. No. Then if one does not exist, none of the others will be conceived of as being one or conceived as being one or as being many, either. For if it is impossible to conceive of many, for it is impossible to conceive of many without one. True, it is impossible. Then if one does not exist, the others neither are nor are conceived to be either one or many. And that's, of course, opinion. Oh, then I if one conceived. does not exist, the others neither are nor can you have an opinion. Ah. Right? It's also a talk say. Go ahead. No, so it seems. Nor like, nor unlike. No. Nor the same, nor different. Nor in contact, nor separate. Nor any of the other things which we were saying they appeared to be. The others neither are nor appear to be any of these. If the one does not exist. True. Then if we were to say in a word, if the one is not, nothing is, should be right. Now that's the conclusion of nine. six, seven, eight, nine. Oh. On the negative side. Okay. Agree? Take a look. Then if we were to say in a word, if the one is not, nothing is, should be right. The question. Now, now he's going to give a conclusion for it all. Then let us say that, and we may add, as it appears, that whether the one is or is not, the so one. One is, two, three, four, five, or is not, six, seven, eight, nine. The one and the others in relation to themselves and to each other, all in every way are and are not and appear and do not appear. Very true. What a That's way to... it. <laughs> see, that in includes one, two, three, all of them. See, that includes all of them. The two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So he concludes at the end of four all the positives. Here he concludes all the negatives. Oh, yeah, the you're telling. I'm telling. Thank you. And then he gives in five lines a complete. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, yeah. three, four, five. In lines. five lines, he can pull it all together. Clever? I don't know if that's clever. It's yeah, amazing. It. <laughs> it goes out there. Pretty amazing. That's cool. I wondered if he wanted to write all this in one page. <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I, think, I think somebody did that. 
Pardon me? I think somebody wrote that in one page. Yeah. I remember reading it in somebody's book. Yeah. He can, page 157, right there. Oh, yeah. It's all right in one page. Yeah. He can take the whole foundation of <laughs> transcendentalism and its denial, a couple of pages wraps the whole thing up. Good. So you can argue for it or against it, and these are the ways of doing it. Wow. So is there some position that holds the ninth? Pardon me? Some, some position that holds the ninth hypothesis? Are there some people who would hold... The ninth? No, the fifth. There's a lot. Louder? The transcendental. Yeah. But what Are there a bunch of people who say they're foolish for thinking that? Yeah. And if they attack their position not by arguing on the basis of some other thing they think is true, but if they show the weaknesses in transcendentalism, could they not say, by the way, your position presupposes, does not, that the one must exist? Must they not? Yeah. And suppose well, if you have no basis for arguing that the one exists, then the what does? There's no reason to assuming the one exists, and let me show you what follows for your position if I deny the idea that the one exists. Wow. <laughs> so they're just negative thinkers. <laughs> negative people. Well, just okay. negative. If you shake your head and mumble, I can't do anything Sorry. for you. Sorry. It's just, just kind of... Mm -hmm. Negative, negative, negative thing. Well, we started out with two positions. There's a, a there's, there's, a, there, there's, there's what is, and there's what isn't. Yeah. yeah. So you have two, three, four, five. What is? And the transitions to what isn't. Yeah. Six, seven, eight, nine. So there's, there's our transitions uh, from our very first hypothesis. Right. Well, good. I feel encouraged to go back and reread it now. That good. <laughs> now that I'm getting an idea of something about it. Ah. Now, if you want, you can also go diagonally. You can also compare them mm. in a number of other ways. That's up to you. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, what do they call those people who are number nine? What are you going to call them? Anti-what? Anti-one. Did you call the fibers by a name? The fibers? The fibers. fibers. The fibers, yeah, transcendental. Therefore, they would be what? Anti-transcendental. Thank you. Okay. What would you call them? Anti-transcendentalists. I don't yeah. know. Is there another? When they're group? arguing? Against the one of five. Yes. See, most people argue that five cannot be true because they believe three, two, or, well, two, three, or four are true. Right. But that's just, that's not arguing. Right? That's just showing differences between one position and another. But if you want to reason, you have to show that the position the person is holding cannot be maintained if you, not, if you deny one of the key points in the argument, which is either the existence or the non-existence of the premise, which is that the one is. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Fine. Materialist. Pardon? Mater materialist? Yes, they would be materialist, but then you could caution them by saying if you're truly a materialist, uh, you don't want to borrow any terms mm -hmm. or terms that can be derived from <laughs> the idea of one. See, the whole, the whole problem chaos. is, see, most, <laughs> people, most people reason with this term, you see. And they don't realize that if you say, excuse me, what do you mean by God? See, because, see, essentially you have this kind of problem.
See, if you want to talk about the difficulty talking about theology, theology, the words derived from the word God, are limited. Right? They're limited by the very nature of language. But the idea of the one, well, oneness, unity, communion, union, whole, perfect, complete, can all be said to be derived from this idea. And therefore, you can, you can make many more distinctions if you want to talk about philosophy and metaphysics, not by using this term, but by using this term. And what he's doing is he's taking that out and he's putting that in. And therefore you can make all kinds of distinctions you can't make this way without building some other kind of argument. Like this goes into cosmology. Well, God is a paternal figure, he's a cosmological agent, he's an efficient cause. But then you're not talking about the things that can be derived from it. See, the 13th proposition, which are... See, look what happens when you do this. You want to argue that there's an equivalence between the idea that the one and the good, well, look what you can do. You can say, well, these are the terms that can be derived from the idea of the good. So all you need to do is say, well, I'll tell you what, um, Maybe, now you have a third set of terms, see? So. You can call them bridging concepts. A process where one, a union can become one. So this category can be a process. So look how easy it is to argue that the good is the same as the one just since you have so many common terms on both sides, you can find equivalences and make statements like that. Now, see the difficulty of trying to do the same thing, putting in the idea of God? It's a, it's a fraught with difficulty. And that's metaphysics. That's why metaphysics is, is, uh, is a rational understanding of sets of terms. Of th and these are in a hierarchy. See, these can be put in a hierarchy. Some are closer to this than others. Therefore, they can actually put into a hierarchy. Now, if you Maybe went back we now and talked about the Parmenides, and you can now say, can you tell me all the places where participation is possible and where it is not? You can now identify them. By the way, was the problem Socrates had with Parmenides the problem of participation? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he's going to show him under what systems you can use the idea of participation, what ones you can't. No. By creating this model. Mm. Oh, wow. Interesting. You did answer Socrates' question. 
I can't hear. I said he was answering Socrates' question in a particular yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, it certainly makes it more fun when you what, understand a little bit, even. What do you think, Mark? Speechless. Pardon? He said I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yeah. We and this is the work. For years, the only person who ever did anything with us was, was uh, Thomas Taylor. Mm -hmm. It was regarded for many, many, many years as just a logical exercise without any reference to anything independently of some logical paradigm which doesn't have any meaning other than a pure sense. Hmm. Did he write a commentary on this? Or was it Proclus? Who? Was it Thomas Taylor wrote I, a commentary I, on this? Do you think so? I don't know. Oh. I know he, oh. he, he translated Proclus. That, I heard that. There's several commentaries on the web. If you look up Proclus mm -hmm. and Parmenides, you'll find a a lot of writing that gives but you I just good insights. But I haven't seen Thomas Taylor's commentary on this, or oh. I just don't. I mean, I. I mean. Do you happen to have a copy? Of what? Of Thomas Taylor? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you notice about it? Or you got it? No, no, I you loaned it out. Oh, okay. He translated. No, would you agree though? That. Um, he has introductions. Oh. Yeah, look, she's got it. Oh, this is a theology, sorry. Oh, okay. Why well, would you agree it's all over the theology of Plato? Would I agree? Would you agree that Proclus quotes the Parmenides all over the place on two places, the theology of Plato as well as the commentary on the Parmenides? Uh, why are we having a problem? I'm not sure who you're talking about. I think I thought. Okay. Do it again. You Would wanted, I agree that Thomas Taylor... wanted to know whether Thomas Taylor wrote any commentaries on Plato's Parmenides. Right. Did he write an introduction? To the... Um, I don't have that. His commentary on Plato's Parmenides. Oh. No, you're not going to find it. I don't know. I'm not. Okay, so. Why? Because that's not in Thomas Taylor's translation, is it? Oh, no. He didn't do one. He didn't. Uh, Dylan didn't. Oh, who didn't? Someone didn't. Someone. Somebody. <laughs> That's got to be in there somewhere. I don't know. Come on, stay with it. Okay. Yeah. You're asking whether Thomas Taylor did any writings on the Parmenides. Right. He also, we have his texts, which is his uh, degree, his thesis, on Aristotle. <clears throat> oh. Which, which is misnamed, and it's not on Aristotle. It's his view of the whole history of philosophy dealing with, up to the, obviously, up to the point in which he, he existed and lived, Thomas Taylor. Oh, really? So it's a beautiful example of how a Neoplatonist or a Platonist looks upon contemporary philosophy in Europe. And in that, he also has sections on the Parmenides. And this is called Aristotle? I don't know. I don't. It's called the Dissertation on Aristotle. It's one of the... Do you have the uh, blue copy? Dissertation on Aristoteles or Aristotle? You don't believe it. I am not. I'm just making sure what it is. Yeah, okay. All right. I have no right. idea. No, no. I hope he has all of the writings here. Let's see. Let's see if 
Well, he, he doesn't. I'll, it's Aristotle. Please, Aristotle. Okay. Okay, he does not have it in this one. Because he didn't publish it yet. These are only the ones he published up to this point. Okay. But there is a volume he did. It's, it's called The Dissertation on, on Aristotle. Okay. We'll look at it. Yeah, I think it's one of the really interesting books of how Platonist looks at contemporary philosophy in the age in which he's been living. And the earlier thinkers, it's real good. So. I'll read it. Thank you. We got out of it. Should we read that? <laughs> what? Shannon. <laughs> Do you, how, do you realize how much trouble you're putting forward? Come no, on. I don't. <laughs> I asked you. Yes, you do. You do should know. we? Come on. I didn't offer it. I just said, should we? You oh, know come it. come on. If we were to follow it, what difficulties would we have? Oh. Oh. Uh. What difficulties would We'd have difficulties getting the text. Everyone would have to buy it. Oh, <laughs> that's it? Right. I'll buy it. A second, right? Would you not agree? Not only that, we would have to make sure that whoever has the distribution has that number of copies. Oh, okay. Right? That's it? Oh, I thought it was well, another it's reason. Well, it's in English, as long as you can read English. <laughs> it's but it's a, good, it's a good It's a good one. Now, uh, Nancy recommended that what we do is that we send around an email and asking people who want to uh, do a couple of nights on Friday nights and uh, uh, t take over a book or some thesis, and I'll sit here and enjoy it. And Nancy suggested that <coughs> Julie Hoygaard uh, be one and Mark the other. Great. David. Um, what, who else did you recommend? I forgot. Oh, let's see, who's here? Brad. Hey, Tony. Brad. Nancy? Sure. <laughs> no, she was the organizer. <laughs> well, that means she has to model it. <laughs> So, but not convincing. I would say the following week, then, let's have a party and talk about it, where we'll go from here. And any suggestions of anyone who wants to uh, push their own ideas, some work or something like that, please go come forward. So, what are you and working on? We'll get Barbara on? to uh, send the message around. Well, so what are you working on? Why should I tell you? You want to know about it. And also, that's why I asked. What do you think is the reason I asked? Maybe we should read a couple of your works. No, no, that bores me. Well, then you don't have to come. Well, because I know what I've written, so it would bore me. Well, I was thinking he's doing the way of the logos and the, what is the other one? Actually, we're coming out with maybe five or six volumes in a short while. Uh, the way of the logos, or what? Five or six volumes of what? My stuff. Oh, wonderful. Of that song. Maybe, depending upon the goodwill of Lulu. Okay. No. In book form? Are you familiar with Lulu? Sometimes. <laughs> I don't all you have to do is once. <laughs> <laughs> One time, yeah. Thank you. Then you can either... Download it. Or... Buy the book. Thank you. So why ask me a question you know the answer to? I'm just wondering when, I guess. Uh, <laughs> when do we have to, how long do we have to wait? I don't know. It's up to the, the gods. Mm -hmm. A couple of months, maybe. Well, what up would you hers. like to explore? I, forget me. Next Friday night we have a party. Well, I mean, he said he'd like other people to, so he can sit through. Oh. So. Well, yeah, that's next Friday. 
What about okay. our reading after next Friday? I'm, I'm listening. If I knew what was going to happen <laughs> after that, I'd be, I'd be at a racetrack. <laughs> well, we are. He's always asking us what we what we'd like to read, and we always offer Parmenides, Republic, and Philebus, and all. I Philebus. Yeah, we were going to do the Philebus, and that's dealing with the one. Make the case next Friday. Yeah, yeah. Friday. Bring the book and make the case. Hey, and Julie, Julie, Julie has a very fine idea. She was going to give a talk on consciousness and psychology. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. Is that possible? Uh, we'll see. See? 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 Depends on what hypothesis. See, you have a formidable, right. Of, right, good. Good. If yeah. you're in the ninth hypothesis, you don't have that. Exactly, or the fifth. Or the fifth. <laughs> Let's go. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have one question. Good. It's a long question. Okay. Anyway, when we first started this, I came in the middle, so I, I missed mm. some points. But we have Uranus and Kronos, and then we have Zeus. And Zeus develops a thought, and that thought becomes the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Where does the area where the parts become a part to, that splits in half, and it becomes four? And two parts. We had a, we had an area that broke into two parts, and I missed on that area. Uh, I have notes on it, but it, they don't make sense. Okay. I had so I'd, I'd missed out on that. So my question would would be that at what position at what uh, in Parmenides, where would, oh, would we study Oh, where would you put mythology? Where would we put the mythology of Zeus thinking the cosmos, and then it all starts separating and breaking into different parts? I'll get it in a minute. So we, got, we ended up with the, uh, we came in with the yin-yang. So we have one as whole, one has a property of being, and then there's a primary pair, and each has the being of the other, mm -hmm. the primary pair. So we have four then, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the second, is that the second Hypotheses or the third? Because I have one, two, three. So that's what I was mis as misunderstanding on that. Well, uh, first, I'm not clear on, on the on the question you're raising, uh, but uh, let's see if we can put it together. Okay. First question, what systems can be associated or be represented in terms of the Parmenides? Right. Right. Is that right? 
Yes. Is there a place for mythology? There is a place for mythology. What is it? that in the Parmenides these are static. They're static. That means like uh, let us assume for the moment we can put in positively uh, transcendental call them, uh, and the true word, religions, and that only means those systems that bind the members together yeah. with a belief. Right? That's the only thing we're talking about. Therefore, there are only three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Those are the systems where, given the universe, that the divine enters in continuously, right? It tries to explain how the divine can penetrate or in some way have an influence in the natural world with the idea of gaps. Okay. That allows it. So there are some religions that feature that, and one of the clearest ones, most pure, is the uh, Spanda Karikika, a Kashmir Shivism. Two, there are many, but clearly one pure one is Taoism. Now, uh, now, these are like colors uh, that you can combine in a variety of ways and do your painting because many religions pick up different elements of these four uh, but in the pure sense we can talk about it in this one but the, notice there is no there is no process described of how one goes to the other. Each is separate and distinct, isolated units. So therefore there's no dynamic within this, mm -hmm. right? It lacks no dynamic. And essentially for this view is that there's no way if you're in any one of these where you can get to the first hypothesis.
without dumping whichever one you're in. That is, it's not compatible. Okay. So, uh, Now, this is why uh, there are systems like Plotinus. He comes along and he's interested in the dynamic processes between them. That's where he lives. Uh, so, in the second hypothesis, uh, according to some good people, uh, it's an exploration, therefore, of the intelligible and world soul. As the third can be said to be akin to soul in certain respects. Now, uh, so Latinus comes along and he wants to, he wants to explain how <coughs> there can be transitions. Parmenides doesn't do that, he puts a pure system. So, um, now, now you, someone, one, someone might come along and say, so, given the idea of the one, the first hypothesis, how is it possible to explain the second. Well, what you're talking about then is some way in which you can what? How you might be able to see the relationship between the two. And then you might want to see the relationship between three. Etc. Right? That's metaphysics. That's the role of metaphysics.
So this statement, another word for the one, is the good. Well, if that's another word, if these two are identical, by what reasoning can you possibly show that they're identical? Metaphysics? That's this, this idea. So, so he's, going to, he's going to reason, notice the way he reasons. Um, he's not starting with this, the good and the one are identical. That's where he's going to go. That's going to be his conclusion. Well, uh, th therefore, would you agree? What is it? He's starting with a universe in which there can be goods, every good, plural. And there's a unification that takes place. Uh, and whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, if it shares in it, it gains a unification. Oh, by the way, every good every good, no matter what it is, must, must have some unification. Oh, every good? Yeah, every good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what does the good do? It unifies what shares in it. So therefore, he has the idea of participation, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The consequence of every good unifying what shares in it is that all union, if every good unifies something, then everything that's in a union is good. Oh, if there's an idea between the idea of union and one, remember that list we had over here? Mm -hmm. One, one, this unity, communion, yep. union, whole, perfect, complete. Right. So therefore, that assumes there must be some level of participation. Hey, by the way, second hypothesis. Third hypothesis. Different kinds of participating. Oh. Oh. Well, if he can now show this, then Is it possible for mankind or man to go through the same dynamic and uh, reach the same end? Well, among the things that you might want to call, would you not agree you might hope that philosophy might be one of them? Health is another. Intelligence is another. Well, every good, and if one of them is health and intelligence and philosophy, well, are they unified? They, there's a unity to them? They're, are they unified? Is there, is there unification to uh, intelligence? Health? Sure. 
Oh. That it must share in, it must share in the property of healthiness. There must be some unification going on that makes it good. Hey, by the way, all union is good. Oh. Huh. Well, then you have to talk about what's the property of the good. Indeed, the good is what makes wholeness. Say, whole, wholeness. And uh, um, what brings about the wholeness of each? Pardon? Isn't it what make, what brings about the wholeness of each? Well, oh, okay. Brings together. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. Uh, I don't have it. Two terms. Um, right, it brings together. Go ahead. I think you're right. I think it brings together. Well, that's so, see, the difference between the way he talks about the good and the one is the one is what brings together and holds together beings. Uh. Right. But just to make the point I'm mm -hmm. going for, mm -hmm. um, which is, we're still on the issue of mythology, if there is this process going on, what can explain it? Because these are static. Well,
Would that follow?
Are these the hen ads now? The eight that would then be the hen ads? Well, can there be Greek gods yeah. that, that interrelate to and, oh, and can be said to represent each of these members in the four levels with its triads? Then what do you have? Then you have gods representing certain stages and functioning in certain ways. And Proclus comes along and says, by the way, you know, that's what Plato is doing in the Phaedrus. There are 12 gods. Those are the stages. And so, If you have that, if you have this, uh, then we can change this. You can take it out, actually, for a moment.
Say? Well, I'm just saying that there's a variation in seven. Seven would not apply throughout for internal reasons, which take a while to explain. So let's just put seven in a, in a, in a box and say variations on seven. I don't understand this, Pierre. I don't understand nine that statement. Understand what? Well, you have if there can be. Give me a number, please. Nine. If there can be these twelve gods arranged to represent this process. No. Okay. Then yeah. what must be the prior conditions that make this possible? Yeah, that's right. I was wondering about that. Okay. Make. Yeah, that's right. What possible? The twelve gods? Yeah, you understand it perfectly. And the arrangements. Okay, then then I don't understand what the and does. And can I take it from two to eight, right? Be used to make these preconditions that we don't know understandable? I don't care whether you know them or you don't know them. I mean, we don't know them at this point, right? I don't know whether you do or you don't. This is making a statement. Oh, okay. I just wondered what you were referring to. I don't know. Okay. I don't either. I don't either. Right? Now, these are called liberated gods. They help man liberate. So. The Hennens. The Greeks. Yeah. yeah the Greeks are, yeah. 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 And then uh, it's either possible then to line them up. See, it's foolish to believe in Greek gods. It's, just not, it's very foolish. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference whether you believe in them. It's not, they're not objects of belief. Mm -hmm. They represent certain principles in, exactly. in the nature of reality. And for short, you can right, you can represent complex thought with these images which take on names of gods, but they're not they're not dancing around for objects of belief. Yeah. That's why strictly speaking it's not polytheism. They've introduced a new word called henotheism mm -hmm. to try to make that difference. <clears throat> so, uh, um, so for any any of these, right? That's where they can be placed or the ideas appropriate for each and uh, <clears throat> strictly speaking uh, each one of these if they identify with it they're caught on that level and ideally then what should they learn it's denial. 
to weaken the power of belief. Well, then they're already, if that is true, then they're already buying a structure, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Oh. So, anyway, I don't know whether you find this useful, but uh, I'm not trying to answer the question. So, uh, like in this case, there isn't a place for them, but this would exist to try to help show how to get out of them, and that's a process, and there are no processes here. There's no, there's no way in which you can move from here to the one itself. Uh, there's no... Now, Plotinus comes along, he says, i got news for you. He says, I'll fill some of this in. So, and Proclus says, hey, um, I can talk about this in a variety of ways to, to make it clearer. Um, but then he's got... But this is where Plato's Phaedrus comes in. This is the whole thing is Plato's Phaedrus. And... Uh, And this is, this is Proclus. This is what Proclus said. And, um, but he really does this, you see. This is really where he lives. Mm -hmm. The nine is... is December no. nine? No. He said, if you assume, if you're willing to assume that men can be liberated and they go through classical stages, or it presupposes classical stages, which they ideally, they may jump in reality, but nonetheless, uh, I don't know whether that's true, by the way. It sounds good. Well, well okay. yeah. I was just thinking about putting it in other words. Uh, so like, uh, So going, going back to your question now, so the, if in this system, if in this system, the key person from whom all of this proceeds is Zeus, mm -hmm. right, which is pure intellect, uh, how come it exists? What's the condition for that to be? Nine. Intellect. Uh, well, if you got intellect, you have to have reason. Something intelligible. Yep. I have that intellect. Right? I mean, intellect has to be doing something. It has to be intellecting the intelligible. And, uh, uh, so you're now, we're now speculating about highest term in this, we're saying, wait a minute, uh, in what kind of universe are we in such that there might be Zeus? Oh, uh, Zeus in terms of this thing, representing a philosophical pedal. And uh, if if the mind of Zeus, right, if the mind of Zeus is the object, well, that presupposes you have to talk about mind. And if Zeus is continuously contemplating his own mind, and if you gain an insight into Zeus, and if Zeus is constantly contemplating the intelligible, then what are you doing? 
Same thing. Counter by the intelligible. Yes. Uh oh. But where did, if Zeus is in that, how, how can you talk about the intelligible as in Zeus, contemplating? Well, I've already done this, so I can't do, I can't use this for that. Well, then this must have, you know, here's metaphysics. So, uh, when you said this for that, just, what are you talking about? Could you just point to that? The this and the that? I didn't catch. I don't know. Right. Say that, uh, uh, if there is such a thing in this process as the key term being Zeus and he's contemplating the mind itself, and if someone experiences the nature of Zeus, they would also be experiencing the nature of whatever Zeus is doing. If he's smoking a cigar, you'd be smoking a cigar. Right. Huh? He's contemplating, then that would be the activity of going on. Oh, but for something to contemplate means there must be an intellect doing something, right? Like sight, like the eye is seeing something. So the intellect must be intellecting, as it were, an activity, the intelligible. Well, then, you know, then he's going to go to nature and he's going to say, hey, by the way, if anything is in anything, wasn't the thing in which it's in be different than the thing? Yeah. Well, if the thing is in something, is it possible then it either supports them and advances them or it makes them inferior, because it couldn't be the same, because there wouldn't be no point in them. Oh. Oh. If it adds to it, makes it superior, well then, <coughs> must have some existence. Oh. It have some existence. And now you put, you have to put a name on it. Form. Darn it. Well, maybe we can get a real insight into this and then talk about what could we say if it is independent. It's all, what are the preconditions of this? Well, then it must be in itself, not in something else, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pranos. It doesn't matter what you call it at this point. But it, it, does it, from this reasoning, have a right to be assumed to exist apart from that in which it's in? Mm -hmm. Metaphysics. Oh, put a name on it. Oh, by the way, in the same way, if you can say, by the same reasoning, does that presuppose there must be something that must be prior to it, for it to exist? Yes or no? Yes. Right. If no, then that's the last term. Uh, we gotta go to here if, it, if it presupposes something, then there's something else that must be said to exist. Oh. Oh, you have to put an aim on that. Oh. So, you're looking, you're, see, you're continuously doing this trip. Uh, Four, four, right. four, four and five, yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the prior exists. conditions for something to be the way that way it is? Mm -hmm. And if those, if the prior conditions allow something to be, hey, can there be a fire? Can there be a candle burning without certain conditions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oxygen temperature or certain temperature. There has to be preconditions for that, otherwise it couldn't be. Logically, are you dealing with the same thing here? Hmm. Must the preconditions be necessarily prior to and allow something to be? Mm -hmm. Well, 
if you push this kind of reasoning, you're going to develop the metaphysics. And that's the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How far can it go? Can it make intelligible? Right? Starting with this, so you're starting with this. Well, then you're building a system. Oh, 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 oh. Hmm. Well, the whole question is, there's either an end to this or it stops somewhere. And if it stops somewhere, can you put that, can it function as the one? <coughs> so, uh, Plato doesn't do that. Plotinus does. So they fill in, these thinkers fill in, like Pro Plotinus doesn't do this. Proclus does that because it's a, it's a gap, so <coughs> they fill it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but this is essential to the triads. Like for something, for something to exist, this chalk, right? Must there not be some power that keeps it together? Must it have some property that keeps it together rather than disperse? Right. And then, can you do something with it? Whatever it is, can you do something with it? Well, then. So then he goes further and he sits back and he says, by the way, I can talk about that in general on a higher level. Whatever is abides, has existence, proceeds, has power to move, to act, to function for some purpose. Now this is also the model for cosmology in Plotinus, right? The one overflows, right, returns, and he's got the whole, he's got the whole metaphysics right here. Right where? Right there. Right there. The triad. Oh my God. He keeps saying this, that, and there. The yeah, triad. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I missed the pointing. Well. Oh, I see. So, see. For it to proceed and return, at this moment, at this moment, there has to be an insight. It returns to its source. Mm -hmm. At that moment, therefore, that must be seeing, agree? Mm -hmm. And seeing something. So that's the birth of seeing and intelligence. So he says, right there, right there, at that moment, that's intelligence. Right? That's encountering something, that's being. Right? It exists, it abides. Right? And it has some kind of, look here, it's got some kind of power to do this. Right? Or vitality. Mm -hmm. Or it couldn't do it. Well, then those are the, has some kind of abiding power, returning. But then Plotinus says, okay, but you know what I can do with that? I can show you at that moment of returning, it has to know that it is encountering what it is at its source. Therefore, there's some kind of intelligence or intelligibility. It must be something rather than nothing that's being. And the whole thing is a, a powerful vitality exhibiting itself in this seeing. Therefore, these three terms must be the three most important terms to explain that moment of returning and seeing. So that's me. That's seeing. It's metaphysical. What is that word under being? Pardon? What is the word under being? Vitality or um, so 
also might take the third hypothesis, see? Uh, there has to be something, right? Something exists. Uh, you can say there's that gap we talked about, right? It proceeds in and out, right? And returns to the next moment. So you can use this language in, in many of the hypotheses. So that was the usia we talked about yeah, earlier? That's right. That's this. See, that's that yeah. moment. That's the moment. Exactly. Okay. Right. He's saying, for that to be there, that's your seat. Right, that's therefore, good. there has to be some, and it's always possible, therefore, it must always exist. Uh oh, metaphysics. Mm hmm. Ah. Thank you. Yeah, long winded. Well, no, that's good wind. <laughs> but, uh, I like that one. So he'll go through this, he'll go through it, right? That's Proclus' theology. And uh, only see, he works, he works in a way that m most moderns can't stand. Uh, See, we would like to proceed the way I've outlined. Start with how a man can proceed through stages right, to the goal. But if these stages are essential, then they must have some mode of existence. Oh, what are the preconditions for that? <clears throat> and... Uh, Whatever they are, are there preconditions for that? That's the way we would like to work. I'd like to start with things that are in our experience and then say, what are the preconditions for that? Because we always use this as a basis and then take the language, if you can take the language you need to describe this, and if that language then can be then used in the preconditions, you may add new ones, and then if there are preconditions for the preconditions, then you're, you're taking language and you're building, you're building up, aren't you? Mm. The trouble with Proclus, as he does it this way. <laughs> right, Mark? <laughs> he takes it from the top down, and therefore we're left with the most, what we would call in popular language, the most abstract and metaphysical terms until you finally Like we we want to go this way, but he doesn't he doesn't go that. He goes the other way, <laughs> and he causes quite a bit of pain because he develops a language. See, he develops a pure language coming down. So you have to follow his language. You can't jump in in the middle because that presupposes terms that are higher, not lower. If he arranged it this way, we wouldn't mind it. But that's not the way metaphysicians play the game. They go the other way. Hey, working overtime. Thank you. Pierre, thank you. Thank you. That was great. That was really good. Well, I'll put it together. Can I ask a... Now, See, 
This is book seven. Mm -hmm. A Proclusist Theology. Mm -hmm. And it's the foundation for a lot of things. That is nice. That's nice. Yeah. And this is see this is the way it goes. Mm -hmm. Only when he writes it goes this way. Yeah. And of course, they were part of a rich intellectual tradition who used language in this way. If we don't, we have to learn it all. Right. So it's a dense. Okay. Ah. Ah. Well, you see, you can't just have the gods. They have to interrelate and represent each of the members here. If you have this, if you have this, it's very com it's a complex system. Can you represent this in terms of some image. What's remarkable, you know, what's re re remarkable is that those gods do exist with those properties and fit into the system. That's, you know, that's right. Ah! So the I mean, that's... Right, Mark? That's mind-blowing. And that's why most moderns uh, reject entirely because that would presuppose a level of intelligibility and intelligence among people before they had the printing press and that's unheard of. <laughs> Could you? Right, I mean, you'd have to attribute to mythology a, a, a kind of intelligence which is nearly impossible for them to conceive of. Right. If you can do this, if it, it can be done. And if those properties of the gods are already in mythology before the metaphysics, of course. Right. <clears throat> Which it was. So it's a heavy load. That was a nice link. Yeah, and it is holes together. If the one brings about the wholeness of all beings. But what makes whole and holes together the being of each is the one. Right? So just to make sure that we're together. All right. Time to quit. It's almost midnight.